Coming to you from the all-new Live House in Hollywood, California. Welcome to this week's episode of Pinsado's Place. Our guest is from Niagara Falls, but now he's gone all the way to Hitmaker. You're going to meet Murda Beats in just a second. Um, but as always, follow us online at Pinsado's Place, at Herb Charlock, or at Dave Pinsado. You can sign up for our newsletter, hit like and subscribe, and please click notify. We appreciate that, and we thank you for that. We have another one of our sound advice pieces from our good friend Mitch Gallagher, which you met a couple weeks ago. Those are our boys at Sweetwater. This week, he discusses drum editing. Roll it, please. Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Welcome to Sound Advice. Today, I'd like to talk with you about drum editing. There are two different aspects to this. One is rhythmic drum editing, fixing problems, maybe gritting the drums. The other is editing for sonics, cutting down on noise, maybe reducing bleed to cut back on phase interference. With a drum kit, you have many mics that are open all at the same time. Signals arrive at those mics at different times, they cancel each other out, and you get phase problems that change the tonality of the drums, particularly cymbals. By carefully editing the tracks, we can reduce that bleed, and we can control those phase problems. To demonstrate this, I've got some drum tracks played by Keith Carlock, an absolutely amazing drummer, from a song on my recent EP. Now we're focusing on just a couple of the tracks here. I've got the two kick drum mics, the two snare drum mics, and the stereo overheads. There are also tom mics, hi-hat mics, and so on. But let's focus just on these for now. I think you'll still hear the difference. So let's listen to these tracks without any editing. You can hear these tracks sound like drums played in the room. There's bleed between the microphones and there's a certain liveness that comes along with that that can be very desirable. But for this track, I wanted things to be tighter. I'm also hearing a little bit of phasing in the cymbals and in the stereo overheads when they're mixed with those kick and snare drum tracks. So one way we could approach this is to put gates on each track. This will automatically clamp down when the drum isn't coming through. The problem is not real responsive when you have an ultra dynamic drummer like Keith Carlock. In that case, I like to go in and do manual editing. So let's take a look at how we might edit the individual tracks. Here's our kick, for example. You can hear there's quite a bit of bleed there. We've got snare coming in, you can hear some cymbals, there's some toms that are bleeding through. So if we go through and carefully edit, we can cut a lot of that out. Now these are going to sound kind of gated, because again, we have chopped some of that decay out of there, but it cleans up a lot of that bleed. We can do the same thing with the snare drum. Really cleans up the sound. If we combine the two of those together, again, they sound gated at this point, but when we mix them back in with the overheads, we're really going to hear what happens when we clean up all of that ring and bleed. Now this is pretty extreme. We've really gone in and cut things and again, pretty much gated that kick and snare, maybe a little more heavily than I really would want to when I'm doing a mix like this. So instead, you can use volume automation to accomplish the same thing, but you don't have to push quite all the way down. You can let some of the bleed through and that leaves a much more natural sound. So if we open this up and we turn on our volume automation, You can see I've entered quick automation curves that drop the level between the beats. Now we'll switch back to the unedited audio. We'll mute the overheads. You can hear some of that ambience is still coming through. It's not quite as tightly gated. It doesn't sound like we're just chopping everything. There's actually a little bit of life left there. And when we blend that back with the overheads, Now I've exaggerated the effects here. I've over-edited things and I've maybe brought the ambience down a bit more than I normally would, just to make the point that you really have complete control when you use this approach. You can either leave the drums wide open, have that bleed come through and have very live sounding drums. You can really edit them and completely take that bleed out and have clean, dry, tight drums. Or by carefully working with automation, you can set things exactly where you want it in between. Very useful whether you're working with drums or if you've got bleed into a vocal mic, a guitar mic, whatever it might be. Also works very well with live recordings. 
Thanks for joining me for Sweetwater Sound Advice. I'm Mitch Gallagher. So he didn't take a barrel over Niagara Falls, but he got to L.A. making hit records. <laughs> Should I? Uh, you could, because, you know, us Canadians do crazy things. Please welcome to the desk, Murder Beats. Thank you guys What's for having What's happening, me. man? Thank that you was guys a for pleasure. Nice to finally meet you guys, too. Where did the name come from? So one day I was in my mom's living room, and I was, I was making beats, and my one boy from Toronto was like, yo, like, you need to put a name to your stuff. If you want to put your stuff on YouTube and you want to get a name, you got to get a name out there. You don't want people just to steal your stuff. Mm -hmm. You want to, like, put your tags on your work and stuff. So I was like, the first thing that came to my mind was Murder Beats. I never really thought about it too hard. You know, I just like, Worked yo, out. Murder Beats. And then I started putting, I made a YouTube account and started just posting tight beats. And then, yeah. Was social media part of the driver? Into 100%. You becoming, yeah, you Facebook. Becoming you? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Mm -hmm. I started Instagram, like, I made my Instagram, like, the day I started making music, mm -hmm. like, producing music. Mm -hmm. so you were like, how old then? 16, 16 wow. and a half, 17 ish, right. I think. Right. So, like, I never had an Instagram before I was, like, like, when I was just Shane mm -hmm. in Fort Erie and Niagara Falls and mm -hmm. stuff. I never really had an Instagram. I wasn't trying to be nobody, be somebody, you know? Mm -hmm. But, but it, uh, a lot of people talk about how that, Actually became a really cool thing because you don't look like a murderer. Yeah, and so, I'm not. so 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 I murder beats. So, man. So, beats. <laughs> yeah. When I first came to LA and 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 I'd walk into a, um, into a session, people didn't think I was the engineer, and I'm pretty sure you had that same experience too. You can't be murder beats, you know. Yeah, but I feel like that's what makes it work. It's, it's like 100. It's like a surprise. It's like it's the shock value, right? Yeah. I feel like that shock value and that authenticity of it is what makes it work. Was family support a big deal along the way? Were you, were you, was your mom and everybody Yeah, a hundred percent. You know how like moms are, moms want you to go to school, mm -hmm. get a job, this and that, you know? Mm -hmm. I was like doing other stuff to get money at a young age. And my dad, RIP my dad, he passed other away. Other stuff. Other stuff. <laughs> my dad passed away when I was like four years ago, five years ago. Mm -hmm. He was heavy into guitar, playing mm -hmm. guitar since he was like a teen. So like mm -hmm. he had me like, they had me listening to rock music my whole childhood growing up. Mm -hmm. um, he was always trying to get me to play guitar, mm -hmm. but I was left-handed. So I couldn't like play his guitar. Right. So I'm like, I gotta get it one this way or whatever. So I started playing like just like I like hitting drums. I go to my uncle's house. I repeat my uncle. He just passed away like six months ago. Mm -hmm. Or like, yeah, I would go to his house and bang on the drums at a young age. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. Just it was fun. Mm -hmm. And then when I got older, I got a pair, I got a pearl drum set. Mm -hmm. And then I would just listen to music. I'd put on, I'd put in my iPod and put like the soundproof headphones over top. And I just like teach myself how to play along to the music. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I got cool. like a grip of it all. Your, your pathway to success. I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm jealous and I'm, I'm, I really admire the way that you've approached success. Like early on, um, you had a reputation for being very persistent. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and not taking no for an answer. I was working with Bobby Smurda and Roddy and Roddy before mm -hmm. they got mm -hmm. and hold their whole thing in New York. But, but talk about how, how you made the decision on, on which manager to get early so, on. So there was a point in my career where I did everything like there was a, the, up to a point I did everything myself, like mm -hmm. came up with my name, had my little graphics made, had my, mm -hmm. did my Twitter, all my socials, started going to Chicago working like working with Chief Keith right when he got hot in GB and all them. That was the drill period. Yeah, right? the mm -hmm. 2013. Mm -hmm. Then after that, I'm like, man, I need to get myself into Atlanta. Found these guys, the Migos. Mm -hmm. They were like, they looked like uh, their music was different. Mm -hmm. I didn't like completely understand it when I first heard it, but I knew it was like, it was super unique and it would be the next wave of music. Mm -hmm. So got built a relationship with them, with QC, with P, with Coach, with everybody, Real Money, everybody, shout out to the whole QC, everybody. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, got into Atlanta. And then I felt like I like, it was the next step. Like I wanted like, th those times I wasn't really getting paid. It was a lot of mixtape stuff. I wasn't getting paid for my work. I was just building my brand. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, I knew my worth. And I wanted to start getting paid and I wanted to get into the Toronto scene mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And that's where I, f I met Corey Litwin, my manager, mm -hmm. still my manager. Cool. And did you, did you go back and forth from Atlanta to Toronto? Was that? Yeah, like part? from like, like Fort Erie where I lived. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, like 10 minutes outside of Niagara Falls. Right. From Fort Erie to Atlanta. Like I'll go. Watch. Got it. I had my mom drive me over the border. Yep. And it was crazy because like back then, like if you got caught, 
working in America and you weren't from America, they could ban you Absolutely. until you get a work visa. Absolutely. And I, and at the time I wasn't making enough money off music to get a work visa because mm -hmm. they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me get one if I'm only making yeah, 10 K a hands. year or less right. than that. Right? Exactly right. So you have to start. So like when I signed my first deal, that's when I could get my work visa. Hmm. But the first yeah. notable success that was a murder beat success was what and when? Who Wait, was it? Was it Soldier Boy? Um, Kind of. So even before that, so there was this guy, there is this guy, this rapper, uh, YB, your boy, mm -hmm. YB the rock star. He's a rapper from the Bay. And when I was in high school, all the, all the kids I was always hanging out with, they loved his music. So I was like, man, like the, that was like my, this is like my first step to building my brand. I'm like, so if everyone's fucking with YB, mm -hmm. I should make some music with them, with him. So then everyone in high school would be like, wow, mm -hmm. Shane's making cool music that we like. Mm -hmm. So that was like what I did. I got to him out the gate. I worked with them, mm -hmm. made them. My, my beats were horrible. Mm -hmm. I had people telling me, wait till I, wait till I got better at making music to, until I started releasing stuff. But I wanted to go out the door. Like I didn't want to wait. Mm -hmm. And then, so I got with him and then I did a song with a guy from Minnesota, Rocky Diamonds. I think he's from Minnesota. And then Soldier Boy got on the remix. Mm. That was all in like the first three months of making beats. That's crazy, right? Just tried to get it out the gate. <laughs> Did it take off from there? Um, I started like to build my reputation. Like, you know, then my Twitter had my credits, mm -hmm. put YB, then I put Soldier Boy. Mm -hmm. Just kept building it from there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then from there, the Chicago guys, I wanted to get to Chief Keef. So I would type GBE in on Twitter and work with everybody around him until I got him on the record and then put all their names in my credits and just start to build it up and then so, build a resume. So you basically perfected stalking as yeah. a way for success. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess. So true. Well, some people call it persistence, some people, but I think the, the, the lesson in that is, is that it's one thing to practice it, but if you don't have the beats or music at some point in time, it's not gonna matter how much you stalk somebody. Like, yeah, and like someone told me like at the begin beginning of my career that this business is 80% business, 20% skill. Mm -hmm. So if you're going into an industry that's 80% business, 20% skill, why are you gonna wait three years until you think your beats are good enough or your songs are good enough or your mix is good enough mm -hmm. or your- That's a great point. Or your building, if you build houses, if you if your houses are like, you gotta just go. Mm -hmm. If it's 20% skill, 80% business, you gotta figure out the business, you know? Did and you I, ever have doubts along the way? Uh, There's always some doubts because everyone doubts you, mm -hmm. right? But I knew this is what I wanted to do. I was making music, playing drums before this. So when when I started to like really like rap music and then I got into making beats, I was like, this is it. Like there's nothing else I want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Describe the murder beat sound. Is there a signature that you have? I got signature sounds in my beats. Like I got this chant. It's like a, it's like a, I put in the mm -hmm. same spot at every beat I make. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just feel like my sound is like the ambience of Toronto and then like the hard hitting drums of like, Atlanta. Mm. I feel like it's like so a when people hire you, that you think that's what they're coming. For? I just feel like they're coming for the the hot white boy with the sauce. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it feels to me like 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 you're very respectful of the 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 classic hip hop too. It seems mm -hmm. like you always have a little bit of some floating through your music that, that's mm -hmm. respectful from the old guys. You know, like what got me into hip hop was like Fifty Cent, Eminem, like mm -hmm. that whole era, and then like. I went through my phases where like I listened to a lot of Wu Tang, listened to a lot of NWA, yeah. listened to a yeah. lot of this, that, and then like kind of yeah. like a lot of Biggie, a lot of a lot of Pac, yeah, but I go hear, buy my I albums. That in there. And yeah. then I feel like I don't know, I feel like so that was kind of like my student of the game kind of mm -hmm. thing, like mm -hmm. learning about it. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. When you produce, does it it does it go past making the beats? Are you doing vocals? Are you doing stuff? Are you writing? Are you hundred percent mm -hmm. at, at the beginning? It's like just making beats, sure. you know, sending beats out. Now it's more like getting with the artist, lock in. Mm -hmm. If I don't like something, something I'm gonna let you know. Mm -hmm. I might chop up the song, take this part, make this the hook, mm -hmm. make this the verse, mm -hmm. redo some takes. What might do you work on? What's your dog? FL Studio. Gotcha. Always gotcha. been. Gotcha. From the beginning. FL Gang. Loyal. <laughs> yeah, got yeah. to be. That's, yeah. the, that's the first thing I learned, you know, like my, my, my friend showed me how to crack it. And I would like cracked it on his like computer, his like desktop computer in the basement. Mm -hmm. And like I started working on that. And then I went home, cracked it on my parents' desktop. <laughs> and then I bought a laptop and then cracked it on there. Mm -hmm. Now I'm on like fully registered. Shout out to FL. I was going to say, yeah. It's a real life stuff now. Can you describe how uh, Travis Scott Butterfly came about? 
That's one of my favorite things you've ever done. So I made that beat in my mom's basement in Canada. No joke. I made that beat. And I was like, this is a crazy beat. Like, it's pretty much like a loop, you know? Like, it's a loop. The intro is just mm -hmm. a loop running. Um, I found, I was, like, listening to some, um, I was listening to some music on SoundCloud. I was trying to find some, like, new artists mm -hmm. in Toronto. So I was listening to, like, some R&B stuff. And the beat was crazy. So I was like, man, this beat's fire. Who did the beat? And then I found this kid, Felix. Felix Leone, he was from Hamilton. So I hit him up. I'm like, yo, send me some shit. Like, I love this mm -hmm. R&B song that you made with this kid. Mm -hmm. He sent me a pack of melodies. And that the Butterfly Effect melody was the loop. He, he, he had no placements, no nothing. Oh, so, like, he sent me the loop. And then I was listening to it. I did the drums to it. I, like, chopped it up. I, like, edited it a little bit and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then sent it over to Travis. And then, yeah, I don't know. I remember FaceTime and Travis. And then we, we were, he was on FaceTime recording it and stuff. I'm like, it's about to be crazy. And I remember when it came out too, because he released it on SoundCloud with two other songs. So it was three songs mm. and they came out. And I remember there was like a Playboy Cardi song, I think with Travis. And I was like, man, this shit, this is definitely the hardest th song. Mm -hmm. Damn. Mm -hmm. But then like two days went by and like Butterfly Effect had like 10 million views in two days. Mm -hmm. and it was just crazy. Just blew up. So now you, you're still DJing and doing stuff and playing gigs. Yeah. Does that inform your production? Does, you know, knowing what the crowd wants, getting it. Yeah, I feel like there. I feel like my it's definitely like polished my ear mm -hmm. in the sense of like what people want. Mm -hmm. But you always got to realize, too, when you're making music, like a lot of the music I make is for what I want. Mm -hmm. You know, so like mm -hmm. when I'm making music, it's like what I want. What do I want out of music? What do I want to listen to? Mm -hmm. You know, but then also once I'm if I'm satisfied with some music, I'm making for myself gonna cater to everyone else too but definitely like playing like i dj coachella last year and stuff mm -hmm. when you do that you see what kind of records move big crowds of people mm -hmm. to like what other don't you know? can you pick up trends at those kinds of things like what's coming what what people are or, or kind is too, of or is it too in the moment and it's just it, i think it's a lot of, a lot of it's in the moment and mm -hmm. then like a lot of stuff is just like th throwbacks that always work and right. stuff i feel like this is what i think right now i feel like once a record goes like three times platinum mm -hmm. it's like known enough internationally where you could play it and get a response sure sure Absolutely. other stuff you might play it and like you'll get you know like some people will fuck with it some people won't know it but once the song's like three times platinum i feel like in the club everyone's gonna know it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's your thoughts on um simplicity like not using a lot of tracks it seems like now nowadays we we seem to be able to as a creative collective we seem to be able to get more out of less tracks than mm. than, the, than the the previous group before you mm. uh, is that something you pay attention to or, yeah. is, or is it just part of your 100 percent. just like keep it simple keep room for the artists to do their thing you know uh -huh. especially when you're working with like really talented people and stuff mm. keep let them keep the room to do their thing you know are you are you using a lot of a lot of loops are, or are you trying to create your own loops or both? I'm or doing both. Whatever works. I'm right? doing both. Like, I've been signing producers. I got, um, I just signed this producer, Mars, from um, Germany. He's, like, amazing at making music. I bring him down. We get hands-on with stuff. Mm -hmm. Try to, like, come up with the next sound. Always got to be experimenting and mm -hmm. just keep inspiration alive, you know, because... Mm -hmm. Once you're like, after the come up, once you're just maintaining, it's hard to find inspiration. Last year, it was kind of difficult for me to find inspiration. Uh -huh. So I've got to get out the house, go do this, go go-kart and go travel over here, go over the, here. Uh, the, the nice for what? The Lauren Hill loop was brilliant. Mm -hmm. That was just brilliant use of that. that uh, uh, I didn't realize that's what it was for a while. That's mm -hmm. how good it was. Yeah, so that was crazy. We... um. My manager was with me at Drake's and we just like came up with that idea and that shit just went crazy. We yeah. knew it was special right when we made it. Like, right. Was that right. the one where you were working on a video game with him? And, and no, nah, we were just we were just like chilling, vibing, uh, you know. I wanted to, to ask because you're a gamer as well. Hell yeah, I love yeah. video games. How, tell me, does that help with your creativity and stimulation? Because mm -hmm. like I, I'm a Call of I play Call of Duty every year faithfully around November when it comes out. And it's such an immersive audio experience, like from dialogue 100%. and sound and music and impact and actually how you get through the game as much with who you kill, but also what you hear because mm -hmm. your directions are coming there. And I was looking at the credits. Um, we're actually going to have one of the Call of Duty music people on. And the credits after a video game 
are about five times longer than the longest movie because of all the thought that goes into it. So as uh-huh. a as an audio crazy. person, when you're gaming, it must just stuff must be coming in your head. And yeah, no, it's crazy. I just love video games. Like, you know, I started playing video games at a young age. And then I just love it, you know. It gets my mind off things. Like I play video games every day, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. So, who are, who are the guys in Canada, guys or girls, that were influencers or people that you you know, look up to or still work with? I know Boy Wonder is one. Yeah, of them. Boy Wonder was a big one. Um, obviously, like Drake, like what he's done for music for Canada. Yeah, it gives you that. It just gives you like hope at a young age that you can do something, right? Mm-hmm. Major. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Is there, a, is there a female contingency of creators, producers, yeah, engineers coming out of Canada? Um, Wonder Girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, Jesse Reyes, super talented. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Talented singer, mm-hmm. artist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, think that, I think that's great. So what's next? What are you working on next? Where are you going? Um, I'm working on my music, mm-hmm. putting songs together. Artist. Yeah, putting songs together, getting rappers together, but like just like... You know, just like making the right records and memorable ones, and moments mm-hmm. from music, and just like DJing a lot, mm-hmm. and just having fun with it. You know, experimenting. You know, might do like a rock project or something. Nice, know, like please do. Just get in there. I love when those hybrids come together. Yeah, like cool just do some out. fun stuff, man. You gotta it, keep it. You gotta you gotta keep it fun, you know, because if you just keep doing the same thing over and over, it gets stale, drag. right? You start to hate it. Actually. Yeah. So, do you, are you in LA a lot now? Yeah. Creating? Oh, All cool, time. cool. You have your own place. You're working on mm-hmm. it. Oh, cool. All the time. Cool. Studio wise, though, I kind of be bouncing around. Oh, okay. But like right now, I, I found this like little low key spot that I'm just like doing month to month at. Okay. So cool, 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 cool. All right. So we got this. I know you're a sports fan. Um, we got this thing called Batter's Box, which mm-hmm. is kind of like he's like the pitcher, you're like the batter. So you, exactly. So your job is to knock <laughs> his block off. Like mm-hmm. don't don't be gentle about it. All right. I think I can take him home. Okay. Couple word answers. You ready? Yeah. Fire the first pitch, sir. Base. Slap it. <laughs> uh oh, this is gonna be tough, Herb. Like that. But I'm gonna take one for the team. Snares. Chris. Travis Barker. Legend. So like something about Travis Barker. So I used to like play his like remixes on drums too. So I feel like that was like a cool point where like. I was into rock music heavy, and that was kind of like a transition into into rap too. Very so cool. Shout out to Travis Barker. We got to do some shit too. I don't know if you're watching this shit. <laughs> I love Travis Barker. Eight oh eights. Are they man made or Jesus made? God made. Mm. <laughs> That's a good answer. Uh, loops. Um. Collaboration. Faith synth. Amazing. Uh, reverb. Key. I like your use of reverb. Melodies. Dance. So uh, that's the vibe. I was going to ask you about NFL Studio, but how about tempo? What tempo do you like? What tempo do I like? Anywhere from 124 to 220. That's pretty fast. I do double time, yeah. Yeah. But that's how I make all my beats are that. If it's R&B, it's more like Nine, like 90 to like 110. And, and finally, inspiration. What's your inspiration? Getting up every day and it's working, man. Living life. God. God's my inspiration. He did good. He did great. He's he, Canadian about it, but he did good. I'm going to win one of these one day. One day. I thought it was going to be today because I thought <laughs> you probably liked me. Before we wrap up, though, give me give me a list of your favorite plugins. Favorite plugins? Mm. I don't be using a lot of stuff. I be using Gross Beat. I got some stuff on my um, laptop. I don't even know the name of it because mm-hmm. I got loaded up at the top of the year. I don't even know. I just be pulling it up. Some analog something. Mm-hmm. Analog Pro or something like that. So it's basically what you feel when yeah. you hear. It's not, not, you're not beholden to any no. certain technology. Uh, like the Fab Filter stuff. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Mm-hmm. I be using that stuff a lot. Do you use stuff on your drums? Because your drums are noticed. For for slapping really not hard. really really yeah it's, everything's pretty raw. I use the legacy settings and the legacy effects in Fruity Loops the built-in okay. effects. But so last night I was just at the Bass Boss warehouse. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Bass Boss stuff, mm-hmm. and um, the resolution quality of those speakers are crazy. So I think I'm about to like I'm using the Yamaha HS8s now. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm about to start 
trying different speakers to get different resolutions mm -hmm. to like improve my mix this year. Mm -hmm. I've never really like focused on that before. Mm. So yeah, I usually just crank the 808s, have the drums going crazy. And then, you know, mm -hmm. And, and that's how you get to whatever change, you get change, to. Is just, don't change too much. No, I know, but I just want to like Sorry. understand more, mm -hmm. you know, because really it's just like right now it's just super raw, just throwing shit together, cranking shit up. So that's crazy. that's the process as you the motorsport, the amigo sound. That's yeah. how you get to it, yeah. just by by feel. Well, I think I think that's I think that's actually pretty cool. We're well, particularly me. I'm a big advocate of finding a balance between using what you feel and hear and your gut tells yeah, you versus, 100 versus technology the thing like another thing how you can describe my music and sound too is just like r the rawness mm -hmm. and just raw a raw sound like mm -hmm. not not putting too much effort in it not overly mixing it not overly producing anything just slapping it together and trying to make it effortless and fun mm -hmm. you know? absolutely well uh from one canadian to another Good shit. Appreciate you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Dave, nice to meet you guys. Take okay. us home, man. Um, man, where can I start? Um, um, I'm a big fan of Murder Beats, basically because <clears throat> he doesn't really uh, observe any laws or rules. He just goes in and does what he wants to do, and it has an edge to it. And, and I like what he, what he ended with, you know, just fun. I mean, music should always be fun, and it should be something that, that we... Try not to industrialize and to categorize and to copy and all that. And so the combination of his uniqueness with that attitude is just very refreshing to me. And I wish you all the best in the world, my friend, because we need that. more people like you. Thank you, man. And that could be you. Check, oh, you know what? By the way, check out some of the, some of the information on him. His, his, his arc and his pathway has really, bit was really impressive to me. So check it out. We'll see you next week.